and no one's yelling at me. So I guess, hello, hello everybody. Hello one, hello all. Today we're talking about topological recursion again. Oh boy, who could have guessed for even more fun in the pocket this time? The last time was already fun, but this one's gonna be more fun. Um, so I apologize in advance that this, this one's going to be a little bit less um, well put together, I suppose, than, than last time, but I don't think it'll be a big deal. Okay, so to start, I'm just gonna go over what I talked about last time so that we all have it fresh in our brains. So I started with this intriguing question about rainbows and like, you know, what's the deal with rainbows? What's the deal with all of these things here, these supernumerary bows? How come those are there when I don't, like, I don't remember these, these, little, these little stripes here from my elementary school class. And the reason was essentially, well, it came from the wave nature of light. Um, essentially, if you treat light as a wave, then these, um, the bands in a rainbow comes from these caustics, where essentially the light folds back over on itself and it produces this, this, um, this certain angle where a certain frequency of light is extra intense. But wave light does not like to concentrate everything all in one place because it's a wave, so it spreads out. So kind of when it tries to pull back on itself, some of it flings off in these sort of, um, these sort of diffraction patterns. And these are what calls those bows. Now, these were um, these were um, investigated by Airy, and it led to his Airy's equation, which was you know trying to investigate this in sort of the simplest order approximation he could. He got this differential equation about the second derivative of a function. I forgot to change this. This is x, and um, let's change that. S x s s. I think I might made it just made it might just have might have made that more confusing. But anyways, um, you know, we have the second order differential equation and we solve it and we get, you know, we can we can do a, a series on this and we can get a, a um, we can solve for each of the coefficients of the series and then we can get an answer. And oh boy, isn't that exciting? Um, which is cool and all, but then it gets really cool when you notice that back in 1990s, Konsevich. Um, found the same coefficients in his series, but his series wasn't from, you know, rainbows. It was from quantum gravity, which of course prompts the question of, you know, what are the rainbows hiding? So hot off of that trail. So that brought us to, you know, what was he actually doing quantum gravity stuff? So this is in the, in the realm of JT gravity. So I, you know, discussed some stuff about how JT gravity works with you and what Ian talked about. And then I, um, you know, this sort of realm that we're interested in has multiple boundaries and each of these boundaries, we have this basically this partition function with a bunch of operators inserted. And to evaluate this, we break it up into different parts. We could break off the, the little horns, the trumpets, and we're left with just, um, and we can integrate over those. And then we're left with basically integrating over the moduli space of, you know, these Riemann surfaces with hyper, with geodesic boundaries of, of a prescribed length. Um, and we can do that by breaking it up into um, pairs of pants. But of course, um, we can't do that in just one way because it needs to be conformally invariant. So we have to sum over all possible ways. And then there's three possible ways. Um, this is important. So I'm gonna go in a little bit more detail with this. Um, one option is we basically, we wanna chop off a pair of pants from this little figure up here. One option is we can cut straight across the meridian and get off this pair of pants and then if we look at the genus and the number of holes, we're reducing the number of holes by one and keeping the genus the same. Alternatively, we can excise it like this, sort of chopping up one of the handles into, into two things. So we're in, in decreasing the genus, but increasing the number of holes. Alternatively, we can split the whole surface into two smaller surfaces, such that their total genus adds up and their total um, number of holes adds up. So these are the three ways. And then basically, this leads, leads us to um, Mirzakhani's um, recursion relations for the volume of these Riemann surfaces. And the essential idea is, well, there's a lot of complicated stuff going on, but um, the, the essence of it is the sum that I was just discussing. We're summing over all possible ways to cut off the free surfaces, which split into these three categories. Um, okay, and that's where this comes up. This, this is our first iteration of topological recursion, from, in this case from JT gravity. So what is topological recursion? Well, it's, you can think of it as it's a way to calculate the volumes of moduli spaces. In this case, the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. 
um, of hyperbolic vectorsomium on surfaces, I guess. Anyway, cool, wonderful. What about random matrices? So now this goes into sort of an equivalent formulation of quantum gravity, which um, has been around for a whole long time. And it's, it's quite nice where you essentially, you treat these Riemann surfaces in a discrete matter through Feynman diagrams. Um, you create, basically, if you use this matrix model, this random matrix model, where the, the action that you integrate is the trace of some polynomial function acting on your matrices, and you're integrating over the space of all, in this case, Hermitian matrices. Um, when you do that, and you try to expand it in Feynman diagrams, you end up getting these ribbon graphs. And when you sum over all types of these ribbon graphs, you see that these ribbon graphs naturally live on Riemann surfaces. And then the power of n, where n is the, essentially the dimension of the matrix, the power of n is, um, well, it's n is 2g minus 2, negative that. Um, so it has to do with the Euler characteristic. So basically, as you go for higher and higher genus, um, then this, the, the term contribution gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So that's the genus expansion. And then the cool thing is, well, okay, we can also take um, observables of that, which correspond to basically, you can think of that as like cutting holes in the remote surface, but in a more discrete way. Um, and then we have these loop equations or the uh, Schwinger-Dyson equations, if you like the physics word for it, but basically just uh, by a simple observation about what happens when you take a total derivative, you can kind of see that you can cut up your surface in a bunch of different ways. Just go through and progressively cut each of the ribbons and sort of expand these holes in your surface to be bigger and bigger. And then there's three ways you can do this and, they anal and they're perfectly analogous to um, exactly what happened in Mirzakhani's recursion relations. So this ends up giving a topological expression for the partition functions and the um, correlation functions of our matrix models. And it gives a recursive way to do it based off of this decomposition. And it has the same recursive structure as Mirzakhani's relations. And this is topological recursion. This is actually where the word comes from. It comes from you know, the physicists doing, uh, well, doing this, um, specifically finding a cute way to solve um, the matrix models, basically a combinatorial trick for evaluating these kind of diagrams. Okay, well, that's two ways. So now let's get into the new stuff. Okay, WKB, awesome. So the start is essentially, um, I just described, or last time I described how to solve these matrix models perturbatively using Feynman diagrams. The question is, can you just evaluate them outright? Well, let's see. So essentially what we're integrating over is space, integrating over the space of Hermitian matrices. This is the Lie algebra of unitary matrices, which is what I'm denoting here. And we're integrating, um, you know, with respect to the hard measure or like the translation variant measure on this Lie algebra. And we're integrating, you know, the, the exponential of the trace of some potential. Now, the thing is, this only depends on the eigenvalues of the matrix. Um, and that's basically, you know, that's almost a definition of how you apply functions to matrices is that you just apply it to each of the elements of the spectrum and do it like that. So what that means is we should, there's a lot of redundancy here, right? Because we can conjugate any Hermitian matrix by a unitary matrix and we can keep all of the eigenvalues the same. So um, basically we should be able to sort of integrate out all of that stuff, which doesn't change the integrand at all and get only left with the, well, the eigenvalue part. So if we do that, um, you get what you'd expect. You basically replace this trace of V acting on M with just a trace, with just a sum of V acting on all of the eigenvalues. That's what you think. But then you get this other term, um, which is a, a, a factor of, you know, this is what you get when you integrate out over that extra unitary part. Um, Mike sort of talked about this, that this was sort of an, he called it an entropic, an entropic effect. But basically what's going on here is that for a random permission matrix, it's very unlikely for two eigenvalues to be the same. The generic matrix has um, eigenvalues that are spaced apart. And the probability function that describes this degeneracy is, 
well, it's this right here. It's the difference of the eigenvalues squared. And you're multiplying that for every pair of eigenvalues. Um, I could explain this if people are interested, um, but yeah. Let's, let's so what's the that. deal with uh, V acting on the eigenvalue? So V is a unitary? So V up here, this is just a function, a polynomial function. Oh, okay. Polynomial, yeah. Um, or maybe it's maybe a formal series if you want to get fancy with stuff. So that's why it that that's why it does what this does. Okay, so now we have an integral over. Now it's just over. Well, it's over R n, or n is the dimension of the matrix, right? And and we know how to do those integrals because um, we've been doing them for a long time. So here's the trick. The trick is we can kind of take this integration measure part and just kind of stick it inside of the exponential. Um, you know what? There should probably be a one over n here, shouldn't there? So what would v normally be in this case? Like what? So v, so for example, it could be x squared. If v is x squared, then this is basically saying you've like taken the trace of x squared. And this is the sort of the free field theory sort of thing. Um, it's like a Gaussian, but acting on matrices instead. So that's like the, the generic case. And then the point is we're taking that and we're adding in some higher order terms, like maybe an x cubed, and that's like an interaction term. So- oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. So uh, we, we took this and we still it away and put it inside this E part. So now we can kind of consider this all as part of one potential, right? And then this is the, the trick of basically saying that, okay, now we can consider this as a potential, not just of like single eigenvalues, but as a set of points on the line where there is not only a potential function in the background, but also this interaction term, right? So this action is identical to the action you get of a bunch of charged particles, essentially, right? So this is the, um, so this is like electrostatic repulsion when you're in two dimensions. Um, pretty sure, um, in one dimension, in one dimension, sorry, electrostatic repulsion in one dimension. So it's, it's electrostatic repulsion in two dimensions. It's just, we're doing it in one dimension anyway. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, that's something that confused me. Um, what, in, in two dimensions, yeah. Okay, so um, what that means is the, the model of, of these matrices, basically we reduced it to the case of sort of figuring out what happens when I have this potential well and I just pour in a bucket of charged particles, right? And trying to see what sort of their equilibrium configurations are um, or integrating over all of their different configurations weighted by this exponential factor, right? So, I mean, what happens? Well, say you have a couple of, uh, of you know, of, um, of, of holes in your, like of, uh, what's it called? Valleys, right? Um, these minima. So you, like you normally you'd expect all of your things to concentrate at the minimum, but they're charged. So they don't want to go too close together. So they kind of space themselves out nicely. Um, and the spacing, if you scale the potential correctly, um, the spacing ends up being proportional to one over N, right? So as I increase the number of charged particles, I accordingly, I increase V and then it, it, it pushes these the equilibrium position of these particles it pushes them closer and closer together. Okay. Now, um, so we want to study this integral. And the idea is when n is very, very large, then this thing over here, um, it limits to the large n. Basically, the only contribution that matters is the large n, is the, um, is the saddle, sorry because every other contribution gets totally washed out by this, by this large n limit. Um, so this is the saddle point approximation that's um, used all the time in quantum field theory stuff. Yeah. So, um, and you know, what, what observable do we want to get from this? We want to get the density of states. And remember each state we're considering as just an eigenvalue of the matrix. So the density, for example, in this configuration, the density is a Dirac delta with one spike at each of these, each of the points of you know, where the charged particles lie. So this is just only one configuration though, but the thing is we're integrating over this whole ensemble of configurations and weighting them, which means that um, 
you know, there's also a chance that we're going to have a slightly different configuration with a higher energy. Um, and that'll be less probable because of this exponential weighting factor. So, um, yeah, so we can actually, like just for this, we can sort of look at what this density of eigenstates looks like once you average over all of the possible positions for all of the points on this line, right? And you end up getting something like this, right? So we have this energy level where most of the eigenstates sort of sit below. And below outside of that, um, well, the density is going to be low because everything's going to want to stick down to this side, stick, stick down to the minima here. So as you get near the minima, basically you get this spike and it ends up looking like, um, I don't know, this kind of this kind of lumpy thing. Um, but you get these sort of oscillations because we're in finite n, we get these oscillations above it, which sort of correspond to, well, the, the characteristic spacing of these oscillations. I'm pretty sure it's just essentially the characteristic spacing of these particles. So this is like saying that, um, you know, you'd expect, for example, that then the, the um, on average, if you average over everything, then there's usually going to be a particle at the very, very bottom, which means it's going to be like a spike down here. And then there's this, this is sort of the spacing. Um, and we're kind of smoothing that out over all the different states. But this is what the density of states looks like for a specific n. Cool. Okay. Now we want to look at large n. You notice this very large n limit because this kind of, um, I guess this kind of brings us back to the uh, genus expansion that we talked about last time. We want to study the asymptotics of this integral as n gets very large. Okay, so how do we do that? Well, let's introduce a new function. Yeah, oh, that's not supposed to be there. Uh, that's okay, so now. Um, let's introduce this guy. So what this function is, um, it is the exponential of the potential to negative of the potential um, times, the, times the expectation value of the determinant of the matrix minus the energy. Okay, so first off, let's kind of ignore this guy for a little bit because um, right now we can think of this, this is just a gauge transform to make the equations look nice later. Um, the, the, the meat of this function is in this. What this basically says is you're taking the characteristic polynomial of our matrix. Okay. Um, Wait, which matrix is this again? We had like an ensemble of matrices at some we point. We have an which ensemble of matrices, matrices, right? So what this is, is um, we have for every, let's actually write this out. It's the integral of e to the negative e over two. So this is this guy over here and then e um, and then that's m minus e, and we're integrating over m, and then the e to the negative action. Right, so this is the weighted integral of um, the characteristic polynomial. So we're taking the characteristic polynomial and we're averaging it over a bunch of different um, choices of the of matrices, all the different matrices. Okay. I wish there was an eraser on this one. Okay, yeah, so let's, 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 we'll come back to this. I, no, no, let's actually do that now, sorry. Um, okay, yeah, so the thing is that this actually satisfies a differential equation. Um, and I, I don't really wanna get into why this is true because it's like at the level of detail that I'm going through that this isn't, um, I don't think this is particularly illuminating, but basically this goes through a, you know, you look at like a series representation of this thing and you just basically formally do it out and then you can figure out this differential equation that's satisfied by sign. I can talk about this in more detail, um, maybe at the end if people are curious and I have time. Um, but essentially we get this differential equation, which has, remember V is a polynomial, so V prime squared is a polynomial, V double prime is a polynomial, and then you get this extra term here, which is, in fact, it's a, it's a rational function. So modulo all of the details. Basically, we have the second order differential equation, um, where it's like it's two derivatives, one over n squared times two derivatives minus some rational function in E, um, and then psi. And this acting on psi is zero. Psi is the solution to this differential equation. 
Okay, so I mean, I just kind of threw this up at the board and said, you have to believe me, but um, let's kind of get a little bit of intuition about how Psi actually behaves. Okay. So here's an example of where the potential is um, just a quadratic, basically like a harmonic oscillator potential. And then you can imagine I, 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 I dump my, my bowl of charged particles in here and they kind of cluster on the inside. And then, you know, for this, this, this region, in the middle, we have a bunch of, um, you know, a bunch of, a bunch of, um, what are these called? Eigenvalues that are, you know, roughly spaced about one over n. So that's what it looks like. Okay. And now what is psi? Let's just, we're just choosing a specific matrix. So a specific set of, a specific set of lambda, we're choosing a specific matrix. And we're looking at, um, this is the, well, it's e to the negative v over two that and minus e. Right, as a function of E. So it's a characteristic polynomial, which means it's a polynomial which has roots at these specific eigenvalues. Now, um, from your experience in line of statistics, I'm sure you know what happens when we try to fit a poly well, essentially we're fitting a polynomial to a bunch of a bunch of points on the plane. They just all happen to lie on the axis. Right. And um, I mean. It might be like if you if you played around with this stuff, you know what happens when you try to fit a polynomial to every point. Basically, you're overfitting this, right? And um, psi behaves like essentially every overfitted polynomial behaves to a set of points. In that near the center, it's a pretty good approximation, right? Like it's roughly around zero. It kind of it kind of matches the straight line of the things. But as you get down to the edges, even though it's a it kind of starts going wild, right? Like it gets really, really, really big and the, the magnitude of psi explodes. And like, yeah, that's just kind of what happens whenever you fit the polynomial to a set of points. Basically the behavior at the edges gets kind of wild. You can't really control it um, when you overfit. And then basically we have that system, right? Like we have this amplitude here, you know, it's getting really wild near the edges, but then we're kind of scaling it back down with this e to the negative v which kind of keeps everything in check. So in this case, it's um, scaling by a Gaussian and this just, this just tempers out all of the, um, you know, polynomial behavior in the edges and makes it so that it goes back down to something reasonable. So this is what psi looks like. And then we can also say about psi um, and, you know, if we actually look in this specific case at E squared, Right, this harmonic oscillator sort of potential, and just plug it in up here and then do this out. You know, it's pretty easy to see. Sorry, it, it doesn't take a long time to show, but I think essentially this is the equation you get one over n squared psi double prime plus x squared psi minus e psi is zero. So this is just Schrodinger's equation, right? This is Schrodinger's equation for a harmonic oscillator potential. So psi is it's like psi is, you know, even though psi is living on the energy plane in this case, but really what it, it, it's behaving exactly the same way as an eigenstate of, you know, a quantum particle in a, in a harmonic oscillator potential well. And as n goes, gets bigger and bigger and bigger, what we're doing is we're increasing the, the eigenstate value, we're increasing the number of zeros of psi. So this is basically a, well, it's, it's, a, it's, it's one of the eigenstates. It's a, it's a um, you know, one of the large n eigenstates. So actually, this is a this is a Hermite polynomial that has this nice explicit description in terms of um, Hermite polynomials in this case. But the point is that this is this is like a nice, well understood thing, and it kind of behaves like you'd expect. Now, Elliot, hold on just for a second. Mm -hmm. uh, for psi to have this nice behavior, both to the left and to the right, the mm -hmm. potential v had to be bounded from below. Uh, yes. Uh, that oh. is a good point because you're right. If if the potential v is like x x squared plus x cubed, then you wouldn't have that property. Um, right. It would become wild on one or the other side. Yeah, I the, the integral I, would also just be divergent. So like, right, was, right. So so, uh -huh. so so that that was an implicit or well explicit uh, assumption of the potential. There are physical uh -huh. reasons for that independently. Uh -huh. I'm a little bit confused because I have seen people using like an X cubed potential, um, but it might be because they're doing everything formally. 
and not actually like evaluating things with natural interval. Yeah, so in, in quantum field theory, it's very usual to have like a phi, you know, phi squared plus phi cubed potential. The right. idea is, you know, as long as you're sort of working in a perturbative regime, mm -hmm. like near, you can do like, or it's as long as it's phi squared plus G phi cubed, then for any small yeah. G, it's sort of bounded and you can do yeah. power series in G and it doesn't matter. So that's probably yeah. why these people are doing cubic. Things. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So the point is we want to study a large n limit of this. Now, here's an interesting way of reconceptualizing this is because we can kind of think of this, you know, this is a wavy thing, right? And it has to have zeros at every single, uh, you know, at every single point of lambda. And, and basic, remember the density of lambdas goes as, 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 um, as n to the minus one. or I guess it would go as n, just kind of getting my densities confused. But basically, this is essentially the frequency, right? Like if this is a wave, then the spacing, then the, the spacing of these things is essentially the wavelength of this. So the large n limit is essentially, it's a, it's a short wavelength limit, right? It's, um, it's, yeah, it's a short wavelength limit, which means we can do this sort of standard short wavelength, essentially a semi-classical limit, um, we can do the standard approximations on this guy. So the trick is what we do is we essentially turn, take out psi and they split apart the phase and the amplitude, right? Because um, in, the, in the short wavelength limit, that means that the phase is changing really, really fast. And sort of um, this, this gives us, this gives us our approximation. So this is called a WKB approximation and essentially uh, what we're going to do is just going to express psi as the exponential of some power series of functions called S sub M, where you're, um, where these are powers in N to the minus M in this case. Um, so S is an imaginary function. So the, the real part of it represents the phase and the imaginary part represents the amplitude. Now, WKB approximation, oops, WKB, approximation like I don't know if you've only like barely heard of WKB before it's probably maybe like from a like a quantum two class where you there's a chapter in the end about approximating things with it and like maybe you find it found it pretty uninspiring I and mean, I certainly did like oh it's just another who approximation who really cares I don't know but I tell you this as a convert um because secretly the WKB approximation is it's really really cool so um, I'm going to spend maybe a little bit more time than is necessary talking about how WKB works, because I just think it's super fun. Um, so, okay, let's get into it, I guess. So I'm, we're going to be doing the, the first order. First, we're going to talk about the first order approximation. So Oh, I totally forgot a slide. Okay, just a second. <laughs> That's awkward. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be using um, the place where I actually drew it to point out stuff. There we go. Oh man. Sorry about this. Okay. So now I can zoom in like that. Maybe that's cool. Okay. So um, so what we do is we take that expression, that exponential of this series, and we literally just plug it into the differential equation, start evaluating terms, right? And then we split terms into orders of uh, into orders of n, and then we take their real and imaginary parts in. And that gives us a bunch of equations, right? So let's just focus on the first two equations you get. I won't, I won't bore you with the details of how you actually get these, but basically you see that, um, you know, the, the zero order equation is this thing. So S, S sub zero is like your, your first order sort of action terms, first order phase term, right? And you take the gradient of that squared and then plus F of E. Now this is a mistake of my part about changing notations halfway through. When I say F of E in this case, what I mean is the, um, I 
I mean this this guy. Um, this whole this whole second part here, um, which which happened to be equal to v in the case where v was just like x squared, but that's usually not the case. But this rational function in in e. Um, okay, yeah. So that that's one of the things. And then there's another one, which is this other, you know, you get this other equation about like the, the gradient of the, sorry, the divergence of the momentum times essentially the amplitude squared. Okay, so what does this actually mean? So this is, in fact, this is Hamilton, this is the Hamilton Jacobi equations. So here's what we're doing. Um, essentially, this is a, this is a semi classical limit. Which means we want to take this, um, which means to like have this a nice geometric sense of this, we want to take the, the quantum equations that we get and sort of turn them into the land of classical mechanics. Okay, where does classical mechanics live? Well, we're going to be using Hamilton, Hamiltonian mechanics, which lives on phase space, essentially a space of positions and momentums, right? And each, right, and if we want to do this on just a real line, okay, then it's just like R squared, one line for position, one line for momentum. But in more generality, we need to do this over, if we're going to do this over an arbitrary manifold, basically a particle living on an arbitrary manifold, then let's see if I can actually. Okay. Okay. Um, if we want to look at a particle living on an arbitrary manifold M, then the momentum is a one form. That's the most invariant way to describe it. So the phase space is the cotangent bundle of M. And we can give this a nice phase space structure through this eclectic form if we so desire. Like we have to give this a nice phase space, phase space structure through the canonical symplectic form. If you don't know much about that, then not really worry. But the point is, um, this is where classical mechanics lives. And we can get there because remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to describe the momentum of a particle. And what's the momentum of a quantum particle? Well, um, if the quantum particle is a wave of a certain um, I guess, uh, frequency, then the momentum is just that frequency and the direction of that wave, right? And remember, we're describing this wave through the phase. And the frequency of that phase is described by the derivative, right? Essentially, this guy right here. So the point is to get our our momentum from, we have a wave function living on M. So psi maps M to C. We have a wave function living on M and to get the, um, to get a, a point in the cotangent bundle, what we do is we take the phase part of it and we take its exterior derivative, right? So this actually gives us a graph of, um, this gives us a graph of, the exterior derivative of the phase over the whole manifold for a given function. Now, what do these equations say? Well, in so many words, these equations basically say, I guess the first equation is the meat of it. What it says is, um, if we look at this graph, so say, say this graph starts out right here and we evolve it over time via like the time dependent Schrodinger's equation. Um, so that changes what psi looks like and thus changes what the graph looks like. Okay, how does the graph change? Well, the first order, it follows this equation. And what that means is that we can consider the, we can turn our Hamiltonian, which is, you know, d d e squared plus f into a function, into a Hamiltonian on phase space, a classical Hamiltonian, just a real value function, p squared plus f, right? Oh, that's unreadable. P squared plus F. And that Hamiltonian has, a, has an evolution in phase space. Um, it has this vector field. And if we evolve according to that vector field, we can just literally take this submanifold defined by the phase at the starting point and push it around according to this vector field. And that gives us a new set of submanifolds. And the idea is this evolution totally corresponds to the quantum evolution, at least to first order. Because if you also track along the amplitude of the wave function, basically um, the amplitude of the wave function is some function on this submanifold. And then as we push it along, we get a new amplitude along this new submanifold. And then at the end, we just project everything back down to you know, our original manifold. 
And that tells us how the amplitude and the phase of the wave function evolves over time to first order, right? So essentially you take your wave function, you, you turn it into something living on a submanifold of your cotangent bundle, a submanifold of your classical phase space. You evolve it according to the classical analogous Hamiltonian to your quantum Hamiltonian. And we, 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 like we changed the submanifold on doing that. And then at the end, we just project everything back down. And that's quantum, that's the first order evolution. Okay. Um, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool, yeah. Yeah, I was um, always a WKB sounds annoying person. I was like, I don't wanna learn about that as an approximation, but that, that was yeah. a pretty good spell. So this is actually, this is one of the few things where the math people have a cooler sounding name than the physics people. Cause this is called, this is basically microlocal analysis which is, sounds so much more intriguing than WKB approximation, but. Agreed. Uh, okay, so now what we're actually trying to do is we're trying to solve this differential equation. We're not just trying to see how stuff evolves over time. We're trying to find a, a solution where essentially, what is it, B over D epsilon DE squared plus F psi equals zero. Right? We're trying to solve this. So what that means is classically, I mean, if, if this is true quantum, that means, well, the first order classically, what this means is the corresponding submanifold that we draw uh, has to be invariant under, um, under this evolution, right? So the thing is, um, well, this evolution, well, the evolution along, according to a given Hamiltonian has to preserve the energy, right? Because um, energy is conserved which means that the, the flow always has to live inside of this, in this case, since it, we're in two dimensions, it lives inside of this one dimensional submanifold, right? The thing is, this is the same dimension as our, you know, as our submanifold, as our um, Lagrangian submanifold itself describing the wave function, right? So that exhausts all of the possible dimensions. Basically the levels, the fact that energy is conserved totally and uniquely describes what the eigenstate has to be in this one dimensional case, right? It literally just has to be this energy level set, okay? So um, that we can see that that's what's going on over here. So let me see if I can make it show up. Huh? Oh, there we go, okay. So, right. Um, so our wave function before, so it's a quadratic potential. What that means is that since, you know, the, the Hamiltonian in this case is um, Hamiltonian is P squared plus E squared plus some proportionality constants. It means that these are ellipses, right? So, or essentially circles for, for change of coordinates. And then this condition that it has to be, so it has to be uh, an energy level set means that the phase function graph has to be literally just this, you know, this ellipse, right? So this is, um, this tells us what essentially the, w, the solution is to first order for this system. It's just this ellipse. Now, this is interesting because, um, let's just stay here for now. Remember, um, this density of states, corresponds to the spacing of, of these, of these um, the spacing of the little dots that we poured into the potential well, right? So what that means is um, the, the derivative, the, the, the derivative is essentially the, the frequency. And that frequency is also proportional to the density of these zeros, give or take. So that this ds is essentially, it's a measure of, row, right? It's a measure of the density of states. So this tells us, you know, this, this solution to this, um, because, the dense, because our characters of polynomial solves this differential equation to first order, the solution to the differential equation has to have this behavior for ds, and this describes the density of states. So basically we've seen, this is essentially, well, it's Wigner's semicircle law. It says that the density of states for a quadratic potential in a, um, in a matrix, model um, has a semicircular, it's a semicircle. If we just cut off the top half, it's a semicircle. But 
It actually says more than that. It says that the density of states naturally lives, like the, the wave function psi naturally lives not just on a semicircle, it lives on this whole double, it's, it lives on this whole ellipse. It's on like, at least in this region, it's like a double cover of, of this line. It's a double valued function naturally. And this level set gives us, tells us like what space that the wave function actually should live on in transit. Okay, back to the actual presentation where I did hopefully didn't forget any more slides. Um, Wait, Ellie, can I ask a question about all that? Yeah. So you were saying that like energy is conserved, so it's gotta be inside like the energy level set or in yeah. one dimension. So like that just determines it or whatever. So mm -hmm. like, if you have another conserved quantity besides energy, like, I don't know, angular yeah. momentum or something like that, does that allow you to like do the same trick in higher dimensions? Um. So it's gonna be a little more complicated. Um, so the, the thing you're groping toward or asking about is called an integrable system where you kind of have enough conserved quantities. Um, and so, and in, being integral isn't quite enough. Uh, as far as I know, you actually need to have, so like you need to have periodic orbits. So an integrable system can be orbits with different periods, like just a particle moving around on a torus, right? The period moving in X versus from moving in Y could be totally different. And if the ratio is square root of two, then it's not periodic, it's called quasi-periodic. And I don't think WKB will work for that. But if you oh, magically like had the a irrational system, line on the Taurus is some sort of like non ergodic flow, or I don't know, I feel like some people are always bringing that up. Or it's like a Lee subgroup that's not a Lee subgroup or something like that. I don't know about Lee groups, but it's not, <laughs> it, it's integrable, but not periodic. So it's not going to be amenable right. to this kind of stuff. I'll Google integrable systems. That sounds interesting. But like, I will. Yeah, that might be what you should do. I will comment that integrable system theory is A, super interesting, and B, pretty much exactly what I'm describing right now um, in so many words. Uh, because that's, that's, that's what the, this all, all of this relates, what I, what I just described is, well, actually, let me say what I just described before I say what I just described. So, uh, okay. Um, so did I answer the question? Yeah, yeah, no, that all sounds good. Okay, so let's do, Okay, so just as a, you know, as a, as a little example of this, let's just kind of zoom in on one of these edges here. So we're at one of these edges of this phase, so the potential is approximately linear. So then we can just, you know, do the same, same trick. And then we'll, we do the same trick. And what we find is now that the, that the momentum is essentially a square root function, right? This guy. Um, yeah, instead of being a semicircle, now it's just a half of a semi, like it's just a square root part. Um, and that's what happens if you zoom in really close to one of the edges. And then if you try to, um, you know, solve the different, if you try to like write down the differential equation at this area, then it is e over b e, e squared plus e, because that's the potential psi equals zero, right? And the solution to this is Aries function. Right, so this is what the wave function sort of behaves like at these, these what are called the turning points, where um, at the boundaries of where the, um, I guess the boundary of the, the space of where the states are. Um, because at these points in the potential locally, it looks just like a line and locally, this is the behavior. These are where area functions come in. Okay, so the point is, now what we can do is we can do the standard, you know, uh, ever famous physics trick of, or math trick too, of just complexifying things, right? So E is a real fun E is a real number. Well, I don't know, let's just pretend it's a complex number. Why not, right? And then, you know, D, D, E. Well, I mean, why not just call it a complex derivative, right? And then it'll act on a complex, you know, instead of um, psi being a, a function, a real function is just a complex function. It takes the complex input and gives a complex output, right? And everything also carries over because even in the picture that I was just describing with the cotangent bundles and stuff, well, then remember a Hamiltonian, P squared plus V of E, right? 
we can just pretend that P is a complex function. If P is a complex number and E is a complex number, V is just a polynomial. This just gives us a complex, you know, a complex polynomial equation. And now it just takes in two complex inputs and returns a complex output, right? No, no, not making any loss here when I do this. So now what that means is um, we get the same equation for, sorry, let me actually say this more carefully. When we do the WKB thing, we try to solve this, um, we try to solve this differential equation the first order. Remember, the only argument I made for saying that the, um, the submanifold describing it was a level set, the only thing that I used was the fact that dimension is one. I didn't use anything about the, the fact that it was over the real numbers, right? So over the complex numbers, the same exact logic applies, which means that for an, a stationary state, for a solution to the differential equation, the first order behavior, the behavior that is invariant under evolution in time in both real and imaginary time is going to be just the space of solutions to h equals constant, right? And for this example here, when it's just a square root thing, and again, once again, you get a square root, but now it's in the complex plane. So um, it's like, yeah, you know, this is the square root here. We sort of have a branch cut going off to infinity. And then we have these two sheets that are interchanged as you move around branch cut, right? The usual picture for a, for a square root. So, um, we've basically described, um, we can describe the eigenstates, the solutions to the differential equation naturally live on, when you can flexify it, they naturally live on this, essentially now it's a Riemann surface, right? It's, this, it's the locus of points such that P squared equals E subset of C um, you know, it's the locus of points inside of C cross C such that it satisfies this equation. And this, this is a holomorphic equation. So it defines a holomorphic, it just defines a Riemann surface. Right? And this Riemann surface is where the solutions to this differential equation actually live. It's where D um, and its height over the plane that sort of describes the density of states. And this is called spectral curve. Yeah, spectral curve. This is sort of the core, the core, the core thing that I've been trying to get to with all of this. Um, is that I mean I could have just said at the beginning, okay, we have this differential equation. Let's just say that um, you know y squared equals f of e. That defines a spectral curve. Why not? Um, but the point is that this spectral curve, and like you could do everything with that, but the point is that this spectral curve really is the natural arena for all of this stuff to take place. It's a natural place where the wave function lives. It's a natural place where the density of states lives. And this spectral curve encodes a whole lot of information about the system, right? So to turn it to an actual nice curve, instead of this like locus, um, well, in this case, it's like, you know, P squared equals E, that's kind of gross, it's, it's C squared. Let's just compactify it, right? So we can take the edges of this, this plane, you know, this is living over a copy of C, and we just take a one point compactification, we add a point at infinity. So we kind of bundle them all up into this one thing up here, right? So we get this, uh, this new um, Riemann surface, at least for this guy, we get this new Riemann surface, which is, um, well, it's a double cover of the projective line CP1, uh, and it has a single double point at zero and a double point at infinity. And just in the way that I've constructed this, it has this kind of ugly qubit, like a quintic cusp at infinity. Um, but you know, you can resolve those singularities away and turn it into an actual nice Riemann surface. Point of all of this is essentially that this spectral curve is a compact, you can think of it as a compact Riemann surface, a compact Riemann surface that sits as a double cover of CP1. And this is for the specific example of V of V equals C, or I guess it should have been F of V equals C, but for any general F of E is a rational function. Then we get, once again, we get this double cover. And it's a double cover with roots at, um, sorry, with branch points at the zeros and the poles of F. Uh, at, sorry, at just the zeros of F. Um, so this spectral curve, basically it's defined as a hyper, it's what's called a hyper elliptic curve. And the idea is that this curve encodes a whole lot of properties about our system. Okay, now 
That's awesome. So basically what we've done is we've, we've described the classical limit of our system, the large end limit of our system to, 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 to first order. We've described it with a, a spectral curve. Now I bet, I bet that this, there's gonna be a whole lot more work to do when we wanna turn this into, we wanna find the whole behavior of the system, right? We can't just all get it from the semi-classical limit, right? Does anyone wanna take me up on the bet? No, I bet it's going to be easy. I bet that this yeah, one's Don't tell anyone. Good. This is, yeah, this is, this is where the profit comes in from the title because you're right. It is going to be easy. <laughs> good work, everybody. We did it. Um, I, I unfortunately did not get any, any money from doing this via my sneaky bet. But uh, before we get there, let's just kind of, okay, what about higher order WKB? Because remember, these are only the first order patients, right? So we can still talk about the higher order stuff. Um, literally, we just take... Uh, yeah, we just take, um, you know, plug in the equations that we get equations for higher order of M. Now the thing is that this gives us a recursive relation. Oh boy, I sure, everybody loves recursive relations. And this recursive relation has a really form, a familiar form, right? So there's this part with M and then there's this part of A and B where A and B add up to M plus one, right? So we're multiplying these together. And this corresponds to, remember that splitting that I emphasized earlier, the sort of splitting that's inherent to these to the recursion relations of both um, Mirazakani and the one from um, topological recursion of matrix models is this one of cutting out, um, you know, cutting out pairs of ants from a surface. And when we do that, this is sort of where this comes from, right? This A and B, what we're saying is that these add, these correspond to the Euler characteristics of the two halves of the surface. Um, Euler characteristic being, uh, let's write it again, chi equals two G minus two plus N. So it has to do with both, it's both in G and N at the same time, right? So that's what this term is. And then this other term is with M plus one, that has to do with just cutting off both the, thing, the things at once, right? So again, we get of the same sort, you know, when we do WKB and we like literally just do out the, um, plug in this formal expression into this differential equation, evaluate what terms get, what terms we get, we get the same sort of recursion relation as we did before. Right, so what is topological recursion? Okay, well, it kind of gives us a semi-classical expansion of a differential equation. Isn't that cool? Okay, so I, I have to speed up a little, be a little bit more efficient now because it's only 500 minutes. Okay, what actually is topological recursion? Because I've been kind of teasing it a bunch of different ways. I gave three different things about saying what topological recursion was and they were all different. So how do we kind of pull this together all into one thing, right? This is the contribution of Einard and Ford, right? Essentially, they took all, they noticed that all these recursion relations really came from the same thing. And they kind of streamlined and synthesized them all together into a single aspect. Okay, so how did they define that? Well, let me just give the definition. So you give me a spectral curve, where a spectral curve means just a, 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 a Riemann surface with a pair of meromorphic functions describing effectively, like say, the Riemann surface could be the locus y squared equals x. That was the one I gave before. So this would be like, these are a pair of meromorphic functions and they define the spectral curve. And what I'm gonna give you is a series of multi-differentials, one for each g and n. Okay, what is a multi-differential? So um, say s is my surface, um, my spectral curve, right? And then I have a bunch of copies of f sitting up here Essentially, a multi-differential is a it's a it's a differential form um, that takes in n different points of the thing. Right? So let's it takes n points and turns that into you know you give me n points, I give you a differential form. So the way it actually does that is you can think of it as a single differential form on this this Cartesian product of all of these base surfaces, and um, you just pull back the the bundle which one forms live in the um, well, the canonical bundle, the cotangent bundle to this, to each of the factors. And we take the tensor product up here. So it's called the exterior tensor, the exterior tensor product. That's what the scary square thing means. Um, but the point is, this is all just saying, it's basically like, a, maybe it'd be like, it's like a function of Z1, Zn, and it gives you a one form. That's a multi-differential. So let me give you some initial cases. First case, um, you know, y dz, 
right? Easy to easy to say. Um, this actually in the in the cotangent bundle picture, this is the tautological one form. So this is something that comes up all the time in symplectic geometry and stuff. So it's it's in that pretty reasonable thing to ask, right? And then W02. The second base case is what's called the Bergman kernel, which is the, the reproducing kernel for holomorphic functions, which means that this is a, a you know, it's a multi-differential in that it takes two things in. And if we integrate, you know, this is a this gives you a one form, so we can integrate over a curve. Um, if we integrate any given function and we take a path integral over a loop in z, that gives us just a function path loop over z prime that just gives us the function of z. So that's what the Bergman kernel is, and it has a bunch of other nice properties, and I can write it explicitly if I want, but um, point is that we have these initial conditions, and now we can write down the recursion relation. So what I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you how to get a multi-differential of n plus one coordinates um, of ones from, you know, and, and, and index g of a bunch, all of the other ones. Um, now, yeah, I don't know. Uh, since I'm out of time, I don't really want to go through this for detail. Uh, basically, we can kind of like cross your eyes about this term. Um, I don't think it's really super, super deep. But basically, the thing to note is that this has the same recursive properties that everything we've been discussing before, right? Here we have n plus two, right? We have one from n plus one to n plus two, but we reduce the genus by one. And over here, we're splitting into the two halves of it, right? And that, and we're summing over all of the different contributions of, you know, um, putting the, of where to put the loops in all of them are points in the different halves of the thing, right? So it's the same recursive properties as the, um, there's Connie recursion relation and the, and the, and the matrix model and everything. So why, why is it so cool? It's so cool because it generalizes every single other thing. We can get all of the other top -log recursive relations we found from this. Basically, these are algebraic invariants. They're holomorphic one forms, holomorphic multi-differentials on a spectral curve. And just from the spectral curve, we can get this infinite stack of differentials. And from integrating these in the right way, we can get the, um, you know, everything. So for example, the topological gravity, the volume of the moduli space, basically we just integrate it with this exponential factor. It's a, it's a Laplace transform. That's what we get, okay? From random matrix theory, um, this combinatorial trick, well, the remember the random matrix um, coefficients were, did just come from the, um, you know, these, these volumes. So again, once again, these Ws do define these and WKB approximation. We get it, you know, these are just numbers. So what we do is we just sum up everything which has the same Euler characteristic in terms of 2G minus 2 plus M. And then we integrate over all the different factors of the, of the one form, right? So these W, these generalize everything. So is it okay if I take like uh, five more minutes? Because, okay, I think. Sure. Okay. So I find this kind of remarkable. Because basically, like topological recursion, basically, you give me a spectral curve and then I give you the stack of invariants. And spectral curves are kind of ubiquitous in like this little corner of math. They show up all over the place. And everywhere they do, basically, um, topological recursion encodes these sort of universal recursion relations that happen all the time. This um, cutting off these pairs of pants from the surface and you know, recursing over that. So all of these different areas are connected together through the lens of topological recursion. So here's something I stole from the paper. I'm just gonna go through it. But basically every spectral curve has their own set of recursion relations. Um, we have the, um, the, the y squared equals x, basically these airy spectral curve. Um, and that gives you the intersection numbers on the moduli space of Riemann surfaces, right? It gives you, the, it gives you all the, all the information you'd ever want about the cohomology of that space. It tells you about the topology of that space just from the spectral curve, okay? Now we could take this other spectral curve, um, this, this sign of something. This is a little bit funky about why this is actually like a reasonable spectral curve, but I don't really have time to get into it. And that gives you the volume of the moduli space of the surfaces. Um, so instead of just topological information, it gives you the total volume information. 
right? And you can also use this to count other enumerative geometry things like Hurwitz numbers, which counts the um, number of branched coverings at a surface, right? Random matrix theory, all of these correlation functions that we care about, they just come from the spectral curve defined from the density of states, or as I introduced it, from the, the wave function and looking at the, um, the WKB sort of um, first order limit of that, right? And just to like say some other things, maybe if maybe I'll like say stuff that other pe people are interested in and you can kind of capture onto one of them, right? Like from of Witten invariants, they have to do with, it's an enumerative invariant counting Riemann maps from Riemann surfaces into um, other manifolds, like often it's in this case, toric collabials. And indeed these come from a spectral curve and even not theory, right? Like we can, we can do not theory stuff. We can get not invariants from a spectral curve associated with not, right? And even Donaldson Thomas theory, um, Donaldson Thomas invariants actually through the lens of, of like BPS states of supersymmetric field theories, um, I'm pretty sure those also have an interpretation in terms of topological recursion, right? It just connects all of these different things into this one sort of overarching universal recursion relation. And just from this simple equation from a spectral curve, right, you can get all of these invariants out. Like somehow just from this really simple equation, y squared equals x, we get in these intersection numbers. And I just find that kind of incredible. So um, to bring it all like circle, like remember that what we started with was this rainbow equation. This airy was like trying to figure out how, how rainbows work and like looking how light um, refracts off of a, sorry, diffracts when it bounces around raindrops. And then he tried to solve it and he found this um, asymptotic differential equation. And he like calculated series expansion. And it was the same one as, as Konsevich when he was doing his intersection numbers. Because remember, Aries equation, look at this. What does this say? It says P squared plus X, right? That's the set, that's this associated spectral curve. That's just this one right here, right? So the spectral curve describing rainbows is the same one that underlies these intersection numbers. Um, which that's is why, cool. that's why, that's why this sort of thing comes up, right? This is what the rainbows are trying to tell you, right? I got, I, I have like, like just after reading about this, it's kind of cool. Cause you like, you go out at like at night after a rainstorm, but like at night and you'd see the halo around the moon and you realize like looking up at there um, to show you those lights, the universe behind the scenes is like doing this calculation about like, um, you know, diffracting off of, um, you know, the, the through, through this sort of asymptotic calculation it's like probing the topology of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces. Like there's this spectral curve here. And then it's sort of like there's what I kind of imagine there's like this explosion of all these possible different Riemann surfaces with different genuses and different mark points and all of their different configurations. And it's kind of reading that topology and using that to spit out the light that's coming off from the raindrop and going to your eyes and showing you those, showing you the pretty halo from the moon. And that's what's happening every time you see a rainbow. <laughs> and that's Whoa, pretty cool. that is very um, far out. Very far out, bro. And I have much <laughs> more, I'm more I can say, but since I'm already over time, I will stop now and ask for questions. Uh, if we have like two matrices and some joint uh, uh -huh. V of both of them, then would we get a Schrodinger equation in two dimensions? Do you happen to know? I think. What we get is a, uh, don't quote me on this. I think you get a higher order Schrodinger equation maybe. Okay. Um, and then that's basically the, the equivalent to that is if we have a higher order Schrodinger equation, then um, say it's like, you know, it's like D over DX cubed or whatever. And then when we turn that into a spectral curve, we get a cubic equation, which means that our spectral curve is a degree three covering to a degree two covering. Hmm. I think that's what happens, but I'm not sure. So it is, um, it's a, it's a, it's a natural generalization of this story. Yes. Uh, can you link me to like a good place where they derive the Schrodinger equation thing? Um, the Schrodinger equation thing, for, like for, just for the, phi or yeah, for the determinant. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, um, just a second, I have one open. It might take a little while to click through. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's actually not particularly deep. Like you get something for the usual equation, put a result in, and then you just um, do a little change of coordinates to make something um, that looks like a Schrodinger equation. But most people don't really focus on it. So page like 57 or something. 56 or 57 around there. Thank you. Yeah, so I will mention that people usually discuss this in terms of um, what's called the resolvent of a matrix. And maybe that is um, more useful, but I wanted to do it in terms of the, the sort of wave function way, which people usually mention, but don't emphasize. But I wanted to do it in terms of the wave function way, because then I could talk about WKB stuff, which I just find cool. So that was my motivation. Or WKB stuff in that, in that specific scenario. I think it was a good choice. It was a good, it was a good pair of presentations. It's really, we figured out what the rainbows were trying to tell us, which is, which is really uh -huh. key. <laughs> They're telling us to study spectral curves. Exactly. <laughs> Stan's probably happy that the rainbows are telling us to study the toric kalabi yao manifolds and their mirror curves. That's what the rainbows tell them every day. <laughs> uh huh. Yes, Tristan? No, sorry, wrong emoji. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I wanted to pull out the rainbow emoji again. Oh, there you go. <laughs> All right, cool. Should we like, I feel like we should like applaud or something. I mean, it doesn't really work over Zoom, but. Uh, yes. All right. Yeah. That was really cool. Very cool. Okay, so um, what are we going to do next? Uh, Zehong, were you going to talk next time? Uh, yeah, uh, so I'll be happy to um, give a presentation next week. Um, it's like a continuation of the discussion of WKB analysis with more um, 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 condition. And okay. I, yeah, uh, maybe I'll send out the reference I had to you in email so that we can put it on the website. Okay, great. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then, um, then we'll take a break, uh, of course, for Thanksgiving. We could still have another meeting or two in December after the Thanksgiving break. Um, and one thing we haven't talked about, which is related to the SYK model, is uh, holography. I don't know if somebody wants to talk about that. Like, like kind of like the dictionary or whatever, like the like. The what, yeah, there are various aspects what? of it that one could discuss, but we haven't really gone into any of that. Um, yeah, I guess I feel like this was a question at one of the talks. Maybe it was one of Mike's talks where it was like what's the actual holographic content? And then everyone just kind of shrugged their shoulders and was like, well, everything's Schwartzian. So like the eigenvalue distribution is the same, that everything's the same just because of the Schwartzian. I guess I, if somebody has a good reference, I'd be curious, but that's kind of been what I've found is people don't have too much. It's not the same as higher dimensional holography where people are like, oh yeah, this kind of black hole corresponds to this kind of state on the boundary. It, it tends to be kind of like, I don't know. I don't know. If someone has a good reference, I'm definitely... Yeah, Period. but we might we might talk about this more. Sure, sure. If somebody wants to, you know, think about that, we have we have close to a month until until then, so you have time to prepare and read some of the references. Yeah, I mean, Mike, do you have any recommendations for references where that get more into the holography aspect of it? Because you you sort of have the perhaps the deepest institutional knowledge in terms of like maybe having references or something. Yeah. I can look I mean, at something, but yeah. I don't know. So so my favorite is always common to me, SYK, but they, they're not really into the holography. They just yeah, of, they're not really. I mean, I've looked at that. It's a good yeah, reference. It's like a couple it's pages nice at the end or something. It, but, yeah. Um, I don't know. So, I mean, the 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 original, original reference is like- Right, yeah, the Kataev simple model, yeah. Yeah. 
called a simple model of quantum holography or something, which I've never seen, but presumably is available somewhere. Yeah, mm -hmm. I've seen parts of it. I didn't think it was the most enlightening. Kataev is kind of a little bit opaque. Yeah. Um... To him, it's all trivial, you know, whereas to me, I'm like, it's not trivial. Yeah, I don't know if he ever really wrote it up. Yeah, yeah he didn't. That's, that's why they needed to publish a paper. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, like a half hour talk all day. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, I mean, yeah, I, I don't know of like a really, you know, deep. Yeah. You know, oh. there, there's this other thing which I have tried and failed to get through. Uh, on the charged SYK model, where Kataev gives all of his thoughts, or I assume it's him, gives all of his thoughts on, you know, holographies and how it's related to like a thermal bath and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I could, I could maybe use this as motivation to try to assault that again. And, you know, some, it definitely sure. does talk about the deep holography stuff. That sounds like very, like, exactly. Yeah, right. no, that would be very interesting. Okay. Sure. Okay. If I could make one more kind of unrelated comment. Um, sure. Just something I thought was cool is that if you remember at the beginning of the semester when everybody was fighting about which um, topic to do, um, <laughs> I suggested that we talk about the, um, I suggested we talk about um, like the, uh, the Witten conjecture about, about quantum gravity and like, integral systems and that's what this is um mm -hmm. and yeah, also yeah. And dr wentworth suggested we talk about um exact wkb model and that's also oh, something yeah. i talked about <laughs> and then somebody suggested about um this uh the sins they funds i think like prof and each thing about john some on surfaces and that's oh yeah pretty much the same as the um the random matrix ribbon graphs Oh yeah, because so, those are just graphs and stuff on uh, which Macaulay's. That, that's true. So like somehow everything comes <laughs> together into the same thing because all of math is actually the same. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you really took it full circle. Good work, Elliot. Anyway, that's oh. all. <laughs> I mean, it's mostly your presentation. Everyone else's presentation has been like less full unification, eyes open, third eye open, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, by yours, yeah, definitely took us the distance there. Okay, well, thanks a lot for those. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I'll be yeah. visiting uh, next week. Uh, I, I'm visiting Pittsburgh. Okay. Uh, All right. Uh, well, <laughs> after break. <laughs> All right. Okay. Okay. Bye, everyone. Bye, everybody. Have a good weekend.